great. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you all had a nice lunch and are feeling refreshed and ready to learn about glass making in Lee. Uh, my name is Katie O'Connell, as Andy Robertson said. I work for AOC Archaeology, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Edinburgh and Leith glassworks, which we uncovered in 2020. Uh, there we go. Right, so just to give you an overview of the structure of the talk, I'm going to give you a very, very, very brief overview of the history of glassmaking, just to give you some context for the site. Um, then a summary of the historical background, and then I'll dive into an overview of the structures we identified during the works. Postex is only in initial stages, so this is really going to focus on the structural evidence from the excavation. Uh, so this is our site. It's located on Salamander Street in Leith on the former shore. Um, and looking at the history of glass. So people have been making glass somewhat sporadically <coughs> in different places and times since the Egyptians in the fourth millennium BC, um, like this object in the top left. Um, with the Romans, glass production expanded, particularly in the first century AD, and you can see a collection of Roman vessels here in the bottom, bottom left. Um, while earliest glass in Britain occurs from the Bronze Age, but is fairly rare until the late Iron Age. Now in the 13th century, broadsheet glass was developed in Britain. Uh, this involved blowing glass, snipping the ends, and cutting it open and unrolling to form sheets, similar to the process depicted here in the bottom right-hand corner. A century later, crown glass was produced in France, which involves spinning the glass to form discs once it's blown, as you can see here in the top right. And these are then these big circles are then cut to regular shapes. Crown glass was not, however, produced in Britain until the 17th century. Now, although the period, throughout this period, wood was the main fuel used to produce glass, and as Carly was saying earlier, there was a significant shortage of wood in Scotland and throughout Britain. The components not only have to be heated to an extremely high temperature to make glass, so requiring a lot of fuel, but the potash used in glass as a flux was often sourced by burning wood. In the early 17th century, wood was prohibited from being used as a fuel due to depletion of the forest and the need for timber for ships. This led to the development of coal-fired furnaces and to the conical superstructures that we refer to as glass cones. These were essentially really large chimneys which allowed for ventilation of coal smoke and increased the heat of the coal fires by drawing the air through and up. In Leith, two glassworks predated the site at Salamander Street on the north side of the river, but our site at Salamander Street may have been the first glass cone to have been constructed in Scotland. These tall cones became startling additions to townscapes of the 18th and 19th centuries, as shown by this late 18th century engraving of a panorama by Robert Barker, where you can see the glass cones of the site standing proud on the distant skyline on the right-hand side of the image. So that's Leith there, looking down Easter Road, or the East Road. So why Leith? Um, well, this image is an excerpt from View of Leith from the East Road by Paul Sandy, dating to 1751. And this shows the first glass cone just a few years after the glassworks had opened. This is the earliest depiction we have of the glassworks. I think you can see it there. There it is, right there. Um, in the 18th century, Leith was Scotland's largest port. <coughs> this provided both supply and demand for young glassworks. On the one hand, the raw materials needed for glass production were available relatively locally, with sand coming from Trenent, just down the coast, coal from the Firth of Forth, and potash coming in from the kelp burning industry of coastal Scotland. At the same time, huge amounts of wine and port were being imported into Scotland through Leith. This meant a ready market for bottles. Edinburgh, as a centre of the Scottish Enlightenment, was at the forefront of many sciences developing in the city, particularly the university, which required high-quality glasswares. And of course, during the later life of the glassworks, Newtown was being constructed, creating a significant demand for window glass as well as ornate tablewares. This was a period of increased investment in the city, following a period of unrest in the preceding decades. This was after the Act of Union of 1704, with the Porteous riots occurring in the city in 1737, and of course the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. 
It is in this context, and in this context, it's perhaps not surprising that the development of a glassworks bringing industry to the area was actively encouraged by the borough council, who charged a very low rent for the land. Now, just to give you an overview of the site timeline, the Edinburgh Glass House Company was founded in 1746 by a group of, I think, 26 investors, including one glassmaker. This was constructed on the Sands of Leith, and the first cone was opened by 1747. The Sands of Leith had historically been used for horse racing, um, and this continued on the sands in front of the glass hose house, as shown in this painting here, although this is quite a bit later. Um, from the first glass cone opening in 1747, the business continued to grow, with the second constructed in 1763. Um, in 1782, the production of crystal, or flint, glass started and two more glass cones were added in the 1780s. The business continued to expand. However, trouble was afoot with the slowing of the wine trade from France due to the war and the onset of the American War of Independence interrupting the export market. By 1815, only two cones were in operation which were focused on bottle production. Um, then it seems that mismanagement of the business led to both, both a decrease in quality and a mishandling of the finances with a large accrual of debt. In 1824, the Edinburgh Glass Company was amalgamated with the Leith Glasswork Company, which was located just next door. However, the business continued to decline and closed its doors in 1874. Sad times for the glass factory. Following this, it was taken over by a chemical manure works on the southeast side with an expansion of the gas works on the northwest end. These photos are from around 1912. On the left, you can see <coughs> the last cone standing as it was, and on the right, during its um, dismantlement, demolition in 1912. Um, and this photo, taken in 1932, shows the site completely occupied by buildings for the timber yards, uh, which continue to occupy the site well into the 20th and 21st century. So looking at some of the previous works, in 2016, an evaluation was carried out by Headland Archaeology. Eight trenches were excavated across the site to a maximum depth of 1.63 meters, which identifies structural remains associated with the glassworks. Then in 2019, AOC Archaeology undertook an historic building survey of the standing wall around the site prior to its removal. So coming into when we started on the site, um, based on the results from the evaluation in advance of development by Barrett's Homes, we went in to conduct a strip map and sample of the site. The site was excavated in two phases over nine weeks between the 26th of February and 28th of August. This is in 2020, and we had a considerable hiatus in the first phase due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on the historical mapping, in phase one, we opened the northwest end of the site, um, just up here, around two <coughs> of the cones, and this was then backfilled before excavation of the southeast side, much larger area down here, around the remaining two cones. However, rather than describing these from one end to the other, I'm going to do my best to describe them in their chronological order as far as I understand it, in the order in which they were constructed. And to look at our results, this is what we uncovered. <coughs> so these are the remains of the cones. You can see it's pretty similar to the historical map and a host of ancillary buildings. The structural <coughs> remains of the glassworks were buried amongst deep deposits of well, mixed <coughs> rubble, brick, iron, <coughs> ash, clinker, tiles, sand. Uh, a lot of this was due to deliberate demolition of the glassworks, and some of it was later leveling and flattening of the works. Um, there was also a lot of large concrete strip and block foundations from those 20th century timber yard structures that we saw. And these, unfortunately, in a lot of places, either obscured the archaeology or entirely truncated it. Um, the site is located on the former foreshore, and the natural deposits where, where they were encountered consisted of a light yellow, white yellow beach sand. This was encountered at a minimum of one meter deep, but test bits on the northeast side show to three and a half meters demonstrated multiple horizons of dump materials such as coal and cinder. So <coughs> since you can see in here, all these lenses. Um, which were amongst the natural doom deposits and seemed to indicate historical dumping which may predate the glassworks. However, we were still able to uncover significant remains relating to the glass factory. This is Cone A, uh, imaginatively named. 
Um, the first cone which we excavated and the first cone to have been constructed on the site in 1747. You can see here that it's constructed of a solid circular sandstone wall which measured 1.75 meters thick and survived to a maximum height of four meters. Or sorry, four meters, that would be amazing. 0.4 meters <laughs> with an external diameter of 19.5 meters. The circular form of the glass cone is bisected by a <coughs> linear furnace and flue through here. This is the northwest end, so it's on the uh, same alignment as the overall site. Um, no flooring surfaces survived within the cone, but it's likely these would have been at a much higher level within the structure. And what we're actually seeing here is the foundation courses of the glass cone, which most likely had a red brick superstructure. Um, we also found evidence for how they constructed the, the cone. They laid wooden planks on beams underneath the wall, and these seem to have been laid out for just laying out the circle. We didn't find these under other buildings on the site, any sort of, let's say, normal shaped buildings, just under two of the glass cones. Um, and this is another look at that cone from different angles. This is looking at it from the north, and this is from the south, so it's glassed out. Um, so looking at the furnace in a bit more detail, the furnace and flue had been considerably damaged by later activity. You, I mean, you can see here it's been totally truncated and trashed out in places. Um, but we can still make out the original form. It was four and a half meters wide externally. The furnace itself was three meters long and 1.2 meters wide internally. It's constructed around a central fire trench <coughs> with edge set bricks set in the floor, as you can see here. Um, and two siege benches or sort of platforms here on either side, uh, there would have been one here, um, on which the crucibles or pots would have been placed for the melting of glass. A low arch would have been constructed over the tops of these pots to refract heat and direct it around the pots. At either end, the vent or flue, which you can see, that's there, and extending back this way, uh, would have allowed air flow through to drive the heat and encourage smoke to rise out the top of the conical superstructure. And this is a diagram of a historical, it would have been something like this. You see you've got your pots, small pots up here, and the arch structure and the flue underneath. So the fire would have been somewhere here, um, and then some unfortunate people would have had to go in and pull all the ash out from underneath. We also had evidence for ancillary structures around the cone. Structures three, eight, and 10 formed annular structures around the glass house cone. Structure eight and 10 had almost entirely been truncated by later activities, but more of structure three survived with a red brick surface. You can see here in the top right. Um, as excavated, it was in a later configuration with the outer wall comprising a mixed construction of reused masonry, bricks, glass slag, and mortar. But some elements of the earlier structure survived as fragments of sandstone walls and large stone plinths that were found in the floor, just in around here, which was probably the original layout of the structure and probably supported large arches as well. So I think this is most likely where annealing took place, and that's the process by which glass is gradually cooled to prevent thermal shock of the fabric. And just to look at another of the ancillary buildings, this is structure two. This, as with every structure on the site, had several phases of modification. Overall, it was an L-shaped structure divided into separate rooms. Uh, this is a later 19th century bitumen flooring that you can see here, which obscured a lot of it. Um, but one of the part of the structure here on the left seemed to have a fire brick surface. So that may have been related to more firing activities, perhaps for the crucibles or pots. Combining this with the historical evidence, I would suggest that this is the pot loft where they were stored and made. Um, and we uncovered some of the evidence of the earlier form of the structure. So this wall is, so it was under here, under this bitumen surface. Um, and this is predating the 1750s expansion of the glasswork. And this is the adjoined wall, which is there along that side. So we can see that it was much smaller in the first phase. Uh, and you can also see they're really strongly constructed, substantial sandstone walls that are deeply bedded, which is in marked contrast to later structures on site, which were hardly, hardly had any foundations at all. Moving on, this is cone D. Um, this is the last cone we excavated, but I believe it was the second constructed on the site, certainly by 1764. It's similar to cone A, having a solid sandstone wall that had been constructed on a timber formwork. 
um, you can see there on the right. The walls were 1.5 meters wide and survived to a height of 1.3 meters, so it was pretty incredible. No surviving floor surfaces survived again, but I again think these were probably at a higher surface, though they may have been robbed out. It was also on the same alignment with the northwest southeast linear furnace. Uh, this furnace structure survived much better to a height of 0.9 meters. It had thick stone walls defining the structure with the interior faced with a staggered brick lining where metal fittings, you can see there, would have supported the iron fire grate. So that one's shiny. So looking at some of the structures around that, um, we had another annealing house at the far end, um, which was probably part of an early phase, but not much of it survived. And to the southeast, the central flue led into a series of structures, quite a mess of structures, um, and these were continuously redeveloped, likely had a range of different functions. Structure 54 was the earliest of these, which can sort of, there's like a little bit of wall out there, coming around, joining this big sandstone wall, which seems to be part of the first phase of the cone. Um, and four additional vents, or flues, you can see here, were added into the cone to add more um, airflow, increase the heat. Cone C uh, was separated from cone D by row structures. This was clearly of a very different construction. Uh, it comprised eight large ca carved sandstone plinths encompassed within an overall sub-square structure. Um, in each corner of the square structure, there were brick chambers. I am not certain of these function or even if they are part of the same phase. Unfortunately, cone C was reused during the chemical manure works, including insertion of a sort of chimney right in the middle of the furnace. So it was very difficult to understand which bits belonged to which. It was also, well, it was heavily disturbed and there was also a lot of contamination um, associated with the chemical manure works, which I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and this is cone B, which was the second one we excavated right next to cone A, <coughs> you see over there. Uh, this was the last cone constructed on the site sometime in the 1780s. And it was the last one to be demolished, the photos that we saw from 1912. So constructed some 40 odd years after Cone A, it's quite a different structural type with eight, eight sort of polygonal bases. Oh, there we go, you can see it again there. Um, and it's also in a different orientation to the other cones. And I think this is to do with taking advantage of the onshore wind coming from the northeast and that's why maybe the other vents are added as well at on that same orientation. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the detail, it was fairly well preserved and we have lots of like arch springs, you can see one there, uh, which give us a fairly decent idea of what the interior might have looked like. And the furnace, again, fairly similar, although the flue was a little bit different um, and it had this extra vent, sort of a T-shaped vent, which we have seen at other sites um, from the same period. Uh, this photo by Thomas Begley from 1860, you can see the superstructures of cone B and cone A behind it. So this is cone B and this is cone A and you can see the profile of these are quite different. So this is the sort of plinth with an octagonal interior whereas this is a solid circle. So you can see they are quite different. And obviously there was a whole host of ancillary structures around the glass cones and these varied in size and shape and phase. Um, but as a rule, yeah, they were all multi-phase. Um, there were also several yard spaces with hobbled areas, barrows, tanks with dumps of glass bottles, hidden wells that weren't on the maps and quite a surprise to find, bottoms of machine bases, um, culverts. And it would be a really, really, really long talk to discuss all of these in detail. So I'll just give you a quick idea of one of these. So this is structure 49. Here we are, um, and this is some of the historic mapping showing it's changing over time. And here's one of the blocked entrances, and you can see there is a lot of different phases going on here. This is part of an old wall underneath that's been knocked down, and they, there's like a wooden floor surface in there, then there's a brick floor, and then they block it up, and uh, it's just constant reconfiguration. In this building were three layers of brick surfaces, and we can kind of map match them up somewhat with these. Obviously, they destroyed a lot of stuff as we, as <coughs> they went. Um, and then just to the, just to the south of that is what a giant well. It's about three meters across, which had a wooden lining around here and then a, a stone arch structure over the top. And earlier on, we had excavated the top of it and it was this brick arched 
structure. Um, and then just to the left, so that is here. So this is structure 49. And then just here was a, a big chimney, or the base of a big chimney, I believe. And what I think was happening here, with all the thresholds that we saw in structure 49 were quite big. They would have let in a lot of light. And matching that with the historical records, I think this is where we had a steam engine that was purchased from James Watt by the manager in the late 18th century, and that this may have been the cutting or engraving house um, where the engine maybe powered a lot of the machinery in there. Right, that is it. So just to give you an overview <coughs> of all of that, we found the remains of four glass homes in various states of preservation as well as several associated workshops and yard spaces. A large amount of glass and glass slag was retrieved in addition to crucible fragments, which will be examined in due course in a program of post-ex analysis. The architectural evidence revealed confirms the construction order of these glass cones. Each of these is somewhat unique, although obviously conforming to an overall plan. And this may reflect the ongoing innovation and ingenuity of the glass house manager, Mr. Archibald Geddes. We can chart the developments across the glass houses with the additions of extra flues and an altered orientation for the last home, which you can see quite clearly there, this nice C shape. Some of the most obvious differences are the use of plinths versus solid sandstone circular walls. The first two constructed had solid walls and the second two had the plinths. It's, it might be a technological development, um, not least being more cost and load efficient. Uh, but more openings into the interior would have increased the draft. It may also be related to function. This I'm, I am not an expert on, so I could not say for sure, but it may be that cone A and D were designated as bottle cones, while B and C were for the production of glass, or sorry, of flint glass, crystal glass, requiring a higher temperature. Within these, we also have pretty good evidence for the furnace structures which are somewhat standard for the time. Similar examples have been found at other sites, such as Gauber in South Yorkshire and Morrison's Haven in Preston Grange, just down the road. And we also have extensive evidence for multiple phases of associated workshops and can identify the function of at least two of these, the pot lofts at the northwest end up there and the possible cutting house at the southeast end in there. Now, if any of you would like to learn more about glass in Scotland, I would highly recommend you pick up a copy of Jill Turnbull's book, Goblets to Gaslights, which gives fantastic details of the Scottish glass industry from 1750 to 2006. Um, I'm sure there is a lot yet to be deciphered from this, from this site, uh, particularly when we do the post ex There will be a lot more to unpick with regards phasing and function of the buildings, as well as looking at some of the composition of the glass and the types of artefacts that were coming out. Enormous thanks are due firstly to Barrett Holmes who sponsored the works and to the archaeologists on the site who carried out the works um, and particularly to John Lawson for his continued advice throughout the project as well. Thank you. Thanks Katie. Um, I'm